Hello everyone and welcome to the channel for another C-Star S50 video. Now in this video we're going to be going over some stuff that maybe you already know and also some stuff, some stuff that you might not already know. And so you're going to want to make sure you stay tuned for all of it. Now the things that we're going to be going over are not, in, not limited to these things but it's going to include solar imaging, lunar imaging, planetary imaging, nebula imaging, and galaxy imaging. Uh, and also some scenery. And we're also going to go over the initial setup of the Seastar S50 as well for anyone who doesn't know how to do it. Um, you know, the whole leveling process, even even focusing. You know, we're going to explain how to do the manual focusing, how to save the individual uh, FITS files for later post-processing. And we're just going to go over everything that I can think of. So make sure you stay tuned for the rest of the video. But obviously, first things first, what we're going to go over is the initial setup of the Seastar S50. So let's get started. Alright, so as I said before, the first things first that we're going to do is the actual setup of the C-Star S50, including, you know, the whole levelization, the focusing, everything for C-Star. Uh, but obviously, first things first, what we're going to do is we're going to have our C-Star. The easiest way, honestly, to screw this on is to just take it, make sure you can actually see the hole instead of just trying to guess where it is, and start rotating it on. Afterwards, you can go ahead and just rotate it normally, as generally people would. Uh, but honestly, if you're trying to just find the hole, just blindly, it can make things slightly more difficult. Now, if you're planning on setting your C-Star S50 up for nighttime astrophotography, I would definitely recommend that you point your C-Star basically in the direction uh, of where that object's going to be rising. Um, and then we're going to go over some details later on about, you know, the whole field rotation and everything. Uh, but obviously, you want to make sure your initial setup is towards where uh, the object is rising. Also, if you plan on using your C-Star for an extended period of time, make sure you have a Type-C charger available that you can just go ahead and plug in to the back of your C-Star and also make sure it doesn't get in the way or it's, it's not too sure that it'll basically stop the C-Star from being able to do the tracking properly. Now for this, next thing that we do is we turn the power button on and you have to hold it for about three seconds and after those three seconds you'll hear a beep um, and you wait a little bit longer and it will say powering on ready to connect. So let's wait for that. Powering on, ready to connect. Okay, it is powering on and ready to connect. Obviously it just takes probably about 10 seconds to actually get it set up. And after it is set up, we can go to our C-Star app. Now you'll hear it, the motor is kind of grinding in there. Uh, and once the motors are done, that's when you know it's actually ready to connect properly. So go ahead and open your C-Star app. Now once you're inside of the C-Star app, what you're gonna do is you're gonna press connect here. Uh, it's gonna say connect to your C-Star. You go ahead and connect to that Wi-Fi. And then afterwards, you can actually connect to your own home Wi-Fi. Uh, so go ahead and join the C-Star Wi-Fi first. Allow that to connect. It will only just take a few seconds. Alright, it is now connected to my C-Star S50. Now, what do we actually do to connect to our home Wi-Fi? For that, we go to our settings here, click on Wi-Fi, and turn station mode on. Now, you see that here, it says station mode. Turn that on. It'll search for available networks, and that will only just take a minute. You can actually go back if you have to refresh it. Click on your Wi-Fi. As you can see, I have it there. It's a whole lot of different Wi-Fi's. Not all of these are mine. They're obviously, just one. So, we're just going to click on that one and it'll just take a moment to connect there. Generally, uh, I've already connected to this, so I do have the password saved, so it might not ask me for the password. Uh, as you can see, it does not ask me for the password, but generally, if you're initially setting up your C-Stars 50 and you need to, uh, sorry, and you need to set it up, uh, make sure you t uh, click on your Wi-Fi and type in the password for it to be able to register correctly. Now afterwards, you go ahead and go back and you will be connected to home Wi-Fi, so you don't actually have to be close to your C-Stars 50 for it to work. You can be inside of your house, be a little bit outside of your house, just as long as you're in the uh, proximity of your household Wi-Fi, it will work fine. Now, the next thing that we need to do for your C-Star S50 uh, is do your leveling level process. Your so you'll see where it says, uh, device not level, go adjust, and you click please on that. Level your it'll say, please level your C-Star, very polite, you know, it's very sweet of it to say that. Uh, then you go ahead and start leveling it. What you do here is you take these different things on, on the C-Star tripod, as you can see here. Uh, you can loosen them or you can tighten them. And once you have it in the correct position, that's when you can go ahead and do the tightening. Now, honestly, for me, what I like to do for my C-Star S50 is I like to make sure that the tripod has one leg directly in the back in the middle. And honestly, it makes things a lot easier for me in regards to the actual setting it up. Um, instead of having it you know, at a certain angle that's uh, slightly difficult to obtain with the C-Star leveling on the app, 
Uh, so like like I said, what I always like to do, and honestly what I feel I would recommend for others to do in regards to leveling, this only takes me about 30 seconds to get it actually level now, uh, since I put this tripod like in the back, directly in the back in the center, as you can see. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and level it, and we will continue from there. Now for this, just another example, what I recommend is that you level the sides, you know, obviously the front ones first, make sure that's even so that the bubble, as you can see, is kind of just on top and on the bottom of each other. Afterwards, you can go ahead and just take the one in the back. This is why it's so easy. Take, just take the one in the back and you can move it up and down accordingly to however you need. Obviously, it doesn't have to reach 0, 0.0. Um, that is desirable for anybody who, you know, wants to obtain 0, 0.0, but uh, as long as the circle is actually green, and I definitely recommend you don't allow it to be over 0 0.3, that will end up mess messing up the tra uh, tracking if you're trying to do solar imaging, lunar imaging, or uh, astrophotography imaging, that, that'll mess it up. So make sure it's either 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or even better, 0, 0.0. Obviously, that's going to take a little bit longer, um, but some people can manage it, other people can't. Uh, personally, I'm fine with 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. Obviously, this only took just a few seconds, as you can see, so it's very easy to do. Uh, very quick as well. So once that's done, uh, once you're done leveling your Sea Stars with you, go ahead and press finish adjusting and your leveling process will be complete. Now, uh, the next thing that we could do is check out scenery mode. And for that, let's go to scenery. And we can actually go ahead and move around the Sea Star. Go ahead and open it up just like this. Honestly, I think it's so cool just watching the way it moves and hearing the motors work. All right, once you have your C-Star pointing at an object, all you have to do, it's extremely easy, very fast. Just go ahead and press the autofocus button and it will make sure it gets a perfect focus in a very clear image, which you will see here on the screen. Just give me one more. All right, autofocus is completed. It was very quick and very efficient as well. As you can see, everything is very sharp and very neat. It's very good for such a cheap telescope. Honestly, $500 is the absolute steal for something like this. Uh, it's honestly very, very close in comparison with the Bayonis Vespera, but honestly, I have to lean towards the Sea Star definitely because of the price as well. Uh, definitely makes up for it. Uh, so go ahead and if you want to go ahead and focus on another object, go ahead and move your Sea Star with the joysticks. Obviously, as you can see, it needs to be focused again. So if you need to focus again, press the auto focus button. And maybe you don't want to see all these buttons here on the screen. So all you have to do is press this little button here at the top. And it gets rid of all the buttons. Uh, that basically just gets rid of all the uh, UI. Um, it makes it all cleaned up. It makes it look a lot neater. So uh, I believe this object might be too close to actually focus on. Again, that was an object a bit too close. So I'd probably say that the distance uh, for the actual autofocus to work for C-Star is 50. It is a pretty high magnification. So make sure you don't have an object uh, within 50 feet. Uh, range, otherwise it won't be able to autofocus uh, correctly so far as what I've noticed. Um, but as you can see, the autofocus is extremely sharp and very precise and you can get very nice photography uh, just with this. And I'm just going to give you an example. Let's go ahead and zoom in on an animal right now that I actually see walking by. Alright, it wasn't actually walking by, but this object is actually about, I'd say, 300 feet away from where I am now. So let's go ahead and give a brief example of the how precise the autofocus is and how good of a quality these optics are. So go ahead and check that out here. Press the autofocus auto button and you should be able to tell pretty quick what it actually is. Again, this object is actually about 300 feet away and you can see everything very clearly. Um, these are some beautiful birds right here. These are some of my chickens as you can see. Um, but obviously the autofocus works great. You don't really generally have any issues with it. I've never had any issues with the autofocus with the C-Stars 50 and the quality of the optics are absolutely incredible. Now, what's the next thing that we're going to check out? Obviously, uh, one thing, as you can see, the sun is going down, so I can't really do any solar yet. The moon is over there. It's not quite above the horizon quite yet. But one thing that is going to be showing up pretty soon is Jupiter. Now, with Jupiter, you're not going to want to wait till actually nightfall. If you're going to do planetary astrophotography with Sea Stars 50, do not wait for nightfall. Your image will end up being overexposed and you won't see any detail on the planet. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to wait for twilight. Just when there's a little bit of daylight left, um, but just enough for us to be able to see some detail on the planet Jupiter. So let's go ahead and check that out in just a few minutes. Alright, so it is now time for some planetary with Sea Stars 50. Now, there's actually a huge update that just came out uh, in regards to planetary. Before, it was sort of a complicated process in order to actually do uh, any planetary imaging on Jupiter or Saturn. 
uh, before you would have to wait until dawn. Uh, if you do not wait until dawn, the Jupiter would end up being way overexposed. But Sea Star actually now has a way to basically fight against that. You no longer have to go through any weird process uh, finding the moon first. Now it's extremely simple. Sea Star has drastically improved. Uh, in regards to planetary and it has made things so much easier now and i'm really excited to show you guys how it works so first thing you do is you go to planetary uh as you can see we have a manual focus on so you don't because autofocus generally doesn't work as good uh with planetary as it does um on things like the moon and scenery mo uh, mode and stars uh, we now have the manual focus here which makes things so much easier for us uh, but it also gives us three different options we have time lapse photo and video. Photo is great if you just want to take one single exposure of a planet. Video is best if you want to do further post-processing on computer in order to get the most amount of detail possible uh, with your sea star on these planets. So uh, we're going to go through a little example with, for that real quick. We open up the Sky Atlas. As you can see, it's taking a moment to, I guess, download, basically update. So give that one second. All right, that is now done downloading. So let's go ahead and find Jupiter. Should be pretty easy to find. Just go ahead and hit the search button here and type it in there it is it's actually already right there in the center so let's go ahead and do gazing uh, and it will automatically open up as always and find the object by itself so let's give it just a moment object is centered all right as you just heard object is centered so we should see jupiter right here and there it is looking awesome uh, so there's actually this button up here that allows it to uh, keep it in the center once it's being tracked correctly uh, that way it won't move out of the frame due to perhaps your C-star not being level. It will automatically recenter uh, if it ever goes somewhat, you know, off-center. Uh, so what we do here is in order to be able to see some detail on this planet, we go to the exposure settings. We turn that way down. And as you can see, we now have Jupiter right there. Of course, it looks somewhat like a blob. So what we can do now is just go do some editing uh, of the focus here. Let's go ahead and play around with these numbers until it looks perfectly clear. All right, so that looks pretty clear to me. You can actually see some of the banding here. Let's go ahead and turn up the exposure just a little bit. As you can see, that's too much. Let's lower it down. As you, the, the exposure is pretty sensitive, so you kind of just have to play around with it until you're happy with how it looks. So let's go ahead and zoom back out. Now, in order to actually get some good imaging uh, with Seastar in regards to planetary, you have to make sure you have raw video on and you allow the video to record for about 10 minutes. Now, why is this important? The reason for that is that when you take it into the computer, it's going to separate each different frame of this AVI video and stack it together in order to get a higher resolution image, uh, which is going to allow you to see a lot more detail on the planet than you see now. So we're going to allow this to run for about 10 minutes and then maybe we can go ahead and check out Saturn. As you just saw, Seastar uh, did a pretty decent job in trying to keep the planet Jupiter uh, directly in the center of the screen and if you look here at the video you can see very clearly the stripes of uh, the bands here um, hopefully we were able to get it uh, with the red spot honestly I wasn't really checking uh, I didn't check on Stellarium to see if the red spot would be visible right now but I'm kind of hoping it was uh, maybe we'll be able to see that again later on in post-processing which you'll see uh, closer towards the end of the video um, if you're interested in seeing that uh, let's go ahead and find Jupiter now uh, sorry not Jupiter Saturn let's go to search go to Saturn There we go, and hit gazing, and it will automatically go to our beautiful planet, object. Saturn. Object is centered. All right, as you can see, it successfully found the planet Saturn. Let's check the exposure real quick. Make sure we actually have it there. Set it back to automatic. taking a minute to load perhaps my connection is quite slow and there is saturn looking awesome right there so let's go ahead and do the uh, enable target correction to make sure we keep that right in the center as you can saw saw as well it did a pretty good job in regards to keeping jupiter right in the center uh, there's a bit of movement a bit of vibration due to the sea star actually moving but it's very handy that it was able to stay so accurate on keeping that centered as we need it to be so let's go ahead and lower down this exposure again obviously not as much
All right, that looks like the perfect amount of exposure possible for Saturn. So now let's allow this to run for another seven to 10 minutes and we'll take it inside again later on in the video for post-processing. All right, so that should be enough exposure time on our beautiful planet Saturn. Now, honestly, I was sitting here on my roof, just looking up at the ceiling, sorry, at the stars, and I saw some strange white light moving across the sky, and it ended up burning up in the atmosphere. I'm kind of curious about what it was, if anybody would know. It's 7.23 p.m., uh, Monday, December 4th, if someone could look that up. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Anyways, that's pretty much all there is to do in regards to planetary. Obviously, you can just take photos, you know, you can do the whole time-lapse function, uh, but it's honestly best if you were to uh, record it in an AVI video and taking it for post-processing later, like we're going to do. Um, so probably the next thing that we're going to cover is actually the lunar function. So uh, let's go ahead and stay tuned for that. It's going to happen in just one second. All right, so it is now time to check out the lunar function of the C-Star S50. And honestly, the way it works is extremely simple. So... As long as you have your C Star S50 leveled, the whole go to process is super easy. Um, you really, really don't have to do anything to actually get that set up. So, all you have to do is you press the lunar button here, go to moon. Uh, sometimes you do have to do uh, the compass calibration. So, in order to do that, just go ahead and hit start calibration. Unplug your C Star if you have it plugged in, and just go ahead and start rotating it around until you see that circle turn all the way green. All right, sometimes you might have to go ahead and re-level your C-Star uh, after you do the compass calibration, depending on uh, how you end up setting it at the end. Uh, but after that, it should automatically start doing the go-to once your C-Star is finished being leveled and uh, the compass is done being calibrated. It'll only take a minute to find the moon and just go ahead and allow it to do its thing. As you can see, it has successfully found the moon. So all you have to do is press this yes button uh, and it will automatically do its best to track the moon. Now you go ahead and do your autofocus here. Auto focusing. Because the autofocus for the moon is not gonna be the same thing uh, as autofocus for the stars or autofocus auto on a planet or on the sun. It's always going to be different. Now, you can take the pictures, or if you have a perhaps maybe a lunar eclipse, you can use the time lapse function. Uh, but if you want to get the most detail out of your lunar image, make sure that you switch to the video mode, turn raw on, and then you go ahead and allow it to record for the 10 minutes. So we're going to allow it to record for the 10 minutes, and we'll take the video later inside uh, to my laptop to post process this video. Um, of course, we're just going to let this record and then we'll go ahead and switch to the astronomy mode. So uh, let's let this happen and then let's take a look at the next part of the video. All right, so it is now time to cover the astronomy mode of the C-Star S50. Now, first things first, one thing I do want to cover is the dew heater. So we go here uh, to the S50. Um, by the way, I know a lot of people have mentioned to me the experimental features um, that has been taken off with a new update. As you can see, you know, you press the My C Star button over and over and over again. That was supposed to bring up a button that said it's experimental features. However, that is no longer there uh, with the new update. So if you still want to see it, make sure that you don't uh, update yet. But honestly, it is best for the ZWO's privacy that you, that you do update, you know, that you don't have the experimental features. They're going to be releasing these features in the future anyways. Um, Honestly, it's basically just supposed to test out their new pro mode, uh, as far as I'm aware. And with that pro mode, one thing that they are, in fact, trying to include uh, is the mosaic mode. And that was not in this experimental features, by the way. Um, the thing that was in the experimental features was the three-point calibration, uh, the, the longer exposure times. That was another thing that was pretty convenient, honestly. Uh, but those are things that we're going to be seeing later in the future. So, obviously, C-Star S15 ZWO has put a you know, basically a stop to that because that type of thing is not supposed to be available yet. Um, but it is nice to know that they do have that type of feature uh, planned for the future of the C-Star S50. Um, but they're just trying to test it within the certain developers uh, so that uh, when they actually release it, it will work perfectly and properly just like they want it to. Uh, honestly, it's best for uh, the customer themselves. So 
Uh, anyways, about the anti-dew heater. If you have the anti-dew heater off at the time of uh, beginning to take your astrophotography images and then you go on to turn it on later uh, because perhaps it starts cooling down at night, you know, you start getting fog in your lens, it can end up getting hot pixels in your astrophotography images, which is something that you definitely do not want, um, especially if you don't want to do later post-processing. Maybe if you just want to uh, save the JPEG file uh, just to look at you on your, on your phone, just to say, hey, I took this picture. If you turn this anti-dew heater on midway, that could end up bringing in hot pixels because uh, when your dark files are taken, it's taken at a certain sensor temperature. If you go on to turn the anti-dew heater on afterwards, that temperature of the sensor will eventually change, meaning that your dark files will no longer be properly calibrated uh, to the temperature of the sensor, uh, causing the hot pixels later on. So make sure you have this on for about 15 minutes and then you can go ahead and get started. Now, another thing that you can look into is the advanced features. Obviously, you want to have save each frame and enhancing if you plan on uh, doing post-processing later on um, on serial or PixInsight or whatever program it is that you use. Also, make sure you have plenty of storage space because if you plan on getting a whole lot of exposure time, you're going to need that storage. Now, here we are in the Sky Atlas. Here's another thing that we need to pay attention to. You go to the search. You click on tonight's best. You scroll down and you look at the altitude of these objects. Now, you don't want to allow the sea star to pass about 65 degrees in the night sky um, while you're trying to get more exposure time. The reason for this is because the closer that you get to the zenith or the highest point in the sky, the more field rotation you're going to see in your astrophotography image. So I definitely recommend, um, if you plan on getting a very high extended amount of exposure time, make sure that you stop at around 65 degrees and then you can start it again after it lowers to 65 degrees below again. Uh, that would greatly re reduce the amount of field rotation that you have in your final image and allow you the C-Star S50 to actually track much, much better uh, than it would if you allow it to reach that zenith. Honestly, once it reaches 85 degrees, the tracking is no longer accurate. So make sure that you stop it around 65 degrees to get the best image possible. Now, another thing that we can take a look at in the menu here is they actually have the solar now listed as an object. They have planets and they also have comets. Definitely with comets, I recommend that you don't get too much exposure time. Uh, the reason for that is because you will end up seeing star trails. If you're just trying to specifically uh, track the, the comet itself, as the comet is moving, it is not staying put in one spot of the night sky. No, this comet is continuously moving, kind of like planets. Uh, so make sure that you have... Um, shorter exposure times on the comments unless you have some crazy editing software uh, some process that honestly I'm not aware of yet uh, so if you do have that process you know for processing comments with a really long exposure time please let me know I'd definitely be intrigued now if you go to the galaxy they have a lot of different options here uh, if you look at the little icon you uh, yeah the little picture you don't see any kind of icon there in the corner if you go to nebulous here you do begin to see these little green icons. Now this icon means that the light pollution filter is going to be on. And the importance of this light pollution filter, uh, it is a dual band filter, meaning that it mainly filters in the hydrogen data and the oxygen data and cuts out everything else. So if you're planning on doing uh, astrophotography on a reflection nebula, kind of like the Pleiades cluster or uh, other galactic nebula or dark nebula, it would be wise not to use the light pollution filter. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's gonna cut out most of the light from that reflection nebula or that dark nebula or whatever it is that you're trying to take a picture of. It's best if you only use that light pollution filter on uh, when, you have, when you're trying to take a picture of hydrogen rich uh, nebulas or oxygen rich nebulas. Just to give an example of some astrophotography, let's go ahead and take a look at the Pleiades cluster here. First, we go to the, uh, let's see here, tonight's best. It should be right on here. And there it is. You see it here, the Maya Nebula that's located within the Pleiades cluster. Go ahead and hit gazing, and it will automatically go to that object. Object is centered. All right, as you heard, object is now centered. So uh, you can see this little orange icon, meaning that we are doing stargazing at the moment. Let's click on that. And here is a Pleiades cluster. Now here's a light pollution filter. Uh, you can actually hear it turn on and off, which is actually pretty cool hearing the machine work. Um, but 
First things first, what you're always going to want to do whenever you do your astrophotography is do an autofocus. autofocus. If you don't do an autofocus, your stars are going to end up looking pretty blurred. Um, and the great thing about the C-Stars 50 is that the autofocus is extremely accurate uh, in regards to stars and also uh, scenery mode and also lunar mode and, and solar mode as well. It's extremely accurate in pretty much all aspects um, except for uh, planetary. It does need a little bit more tweaking with that as far as what I've noticed. Um, of course, if your autofocus isn't absolutely perfect as you would want it to be uh, for your astro imaging, you can always use the manual focus, uh, which is an extremely handy tool that C-Star has provided for us. Autofocus completed. All right, as you heard, autofocus is completed. Uh, so go ahead and check. You can zoom in here on a star. And if you're not happy with it, you can go ahead and press these up and down buttons to get the maximum level of clarity possible. There we go, it's pretty clear. Now, another thing you can do is you can adjust the amount of exposure that you have, uh, lower it down to even less. And also this little mark button is only available once you start the shooting process. So uh, just an example, you're going to see it take the dark frames here. Uh, it says preparing for image enhancing, improving image quality takes about one minute. Now, when it's talking about the improving, improving the image quality, it's just talking about taking the dark files uh, in order to stack it in with your light files to reduce noise. Uh, basically just increase the amount of uh, visibility you have uh, without any uh, hot pixels getting in your way. So let's allow this to finish, which should only just take about a minute. Start enhancing image. All right, it is now starting to stack the images. Uh, as you can see, it's taking 10 second exposures. Um, and after the first 10 second exposure is complete, you will be able to use the mark button uh, to basically register what it's looking at here. All right, the first 20 seconds have now been stacked in, so we can press this mark button. It will mark it in just a second. And there we go. It is now marked as the Maya Nebula NGC 1432. Of course, if you have that on the entire time and allow the sea star to stop taking the image uh, with that mark on, it will save your JPEG file with that mark on it. So if you do not want to have that on your final image, make sure you turn that off before. All right, so that pretty much covers everything that there is to know um, about the astronomical function uh, of the C-Star S50. Of course, there's a lot more to be covered in regards to post-processing later on, uh, but that's pretty much all we have uh, in regards to the settings on the C-Star S50 for the astronomy function. Of course, that's until Mosaic mode comes into, uh, comes into play, which I'm extremely excited about that. Just for you all to know, just a quick crash course on that. Mosaic mode is basically just taking different pictures and putting them together to get something like this, which is a small field of view, and making it one larger image, uh, basically expanding the field of view that you can have uh, in your image. So uh, we're gonna allow this to run for a while and we'll take it in later on for post-processing. Uh, if you wanna see that, make sure you stay tuned for the rest of the video. Now there's only one thing left to cover with the C-STARS 50, that being the solar mode. So Again, this is an extremely easy mode to use, just like the lunar mode. And the first thing you have to do is take out your solar filter before you do anything at all. Obviously, you want to make sure your C-STARS 50 is leveled, compass is calibrated. Then you go ahead and take out your solar filter. It's extremely high quality. They did an incredible job with this filter, as always. And you just go ahead and clip it into the top here. Just like that. Then you go over here to your C-STAR app. You click on solar and click installed and go to. Now, as you can see, it says I do need to calibrate the compass, so give me one minute moment to do that. So as you just saw, another really easy way of doing the calibration for the compass is simply just rotating the C-STARS 50 on the head so you don't have to level it again afterwards. As you can see, it is still level. So after you do that, it will automatically go to and find the sun, and we'll just give it a moment to do that. Now, sometimes it has a hard time actually finding the sun. So here's a little trick on how to actually do that. So sometimes after it moves a certain amount, it's going to say the device is not level. That's not true. The device is level after you leveled it the first time. Just go ahead and go back to its original starting position. Once you're there, go back to solar mode, skip go to and observe. Now, if you take your hand and put it behind the C-Star S50, you can move it until you see a little white slit, basically the sunlight shining through the slit between the actual camera body and the lens, uh, sorry, the lens and the body of the C-Star itself. You'll see a line going through there. That means that your C-Star is pretty much aligned 
uh, with the sun and you can work with that. As you just saw, just using that method, I found the sun and it was extremely easy to do. Now, as you can see, it is perfectly centered. We press this button here, uh, meaning that it is in the center of the screen. We use the auto recenter button and we make sure we do our auto focus on the sun. There you can go. There you go. You can see the beautiful sunspots on the sun. It's pretty cool to watch this. Um, unfortunately, as you can tell, I do have some branches in the way uh, of my solar uh, image, but we can go ahead and take pictures. Uh, sometimes if there's a solar eclipse, you can use the time lapse function function. They have these different intervals. So it will take a frame each uh, one of these seconds There's one second, two, five, uh, 10, 20, 30, and 60. Uh, that's perfect for if you want to do a solar eclipse uh, time lapse. And then there's a video mode. Again, if you plan on doing post processing later on, make sure you switch it to raw and start recording. Now, I obviously can't re let it record a very long time because as you can see, uh, shadow is now getting in the way uh, because of a tree that's extremely nearby. Not to mention, you can already see a tree right here, but, and birds just flew in front of the image. But you know, it is what it is. Honestly, you can just take one single exposure of the sun and be happy with it because it's extremely high optics and the solar filter is excellent quality. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of storage space left in my C-Store, so again, I can't record a long video for post-processing, but I'll definitely show you another image that I took uh, with C-Stars 50 using the post-processing method that we're actually going to use for the moon as well. Um, so if you want to know how to do the post-processing for the sun, just make sure you do the same thing as I'm going to do for the moon. Now there's one final thing actually that we do have to cover about C-Star and that is just the shutdown process. Again, it's extremely easy. You exit out of whatever you're doing. You go to your C-Star S50 in the settings and you slide the shutdown and this will automatically close your telescope. But make sure that before you do that, you take off your solar filter so that it doesn't get stuck in there. But again, it'll only take just a second to shut down and once it's done, you can pack it up inside of the C-Star case and go inside. All right, so here we are on PC. Just a heads up, um, if you're going to transfer your files from your C-Star S50 to your laptop, you have to make sure that your C-Star S50 is turned on uh, while you're trying to do the transfer. Otherwise, it will not actually be able to uh, show you any of the files. So uh, once you actually have it plugged in and everything, you can just go ahead and check that out here. Uh, you'll see once it's plugged in, it will open up the folder. You can see both the dark library and the My Works. Uh, but what we're going to cover now is planetary, solar, uh, lunar, and then I actually managed to get several deep sky objects stacked uh, throughout the period of last night as well. And you can see that right here, right there. That's where you can see it. Uh, basically, it's just going to be playing through the whole stacking process if you would like to see that uh, while we actually do the post-processing here. So first things first, obviously, we're just going to copy and paste our files onto the PC. So this will take about 10 minutes, depending on how many things you actually have. Um, and once that's done, we'll get started with the first planetary post-processing. All right. So as you can see, we have all the files here. Now, uh, there's, let's see which one this one is. We have Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, uh, M45, NGC 2903, and the flaming star nebula all here on the computer. And I'm very excited to, to process these, especially the planetary uh, since this is honestly my first time actually doing the planetary mode on C-STARRS 50. Now, the planetary and lunar imaging is extremely easy, and you can do the same thing for solar as well. If you have a solar video, open up ASI Studio. You can find that on the ZWO website. Make sure that you install uh, the planetary video stacking, the ASI, uh, let's see, the ASI video stack, and that's the easiest program that you can use. You don't have to use auto stacker. You don't have to use... Uh, I forgot what the other one is called the pre the planetary imaging preprocessor. You don't have to use any of that. It's just this one program that does it all, and it's honestly super easy. Uh, so make sure that you check it out. It's ASI Studio. Open up ASI Video Stack, and then just like that, all you have to do is take your image file or your video file, the AVI, hit copy. It was captured by a color camera. Hit OK here. You can zoom in to check the the Bayer pattern, make sure that's correct. Make sure you stack pretty much all of the files. I'm just gonna set it at 95 because there are some that didn't come out perfect. And then after that, just go ahead and hit the stack button and allow it to do its work. Now, uh, while it's doing that one, I am also going to stack the 
uh, Saturn video. So let me go ahead and open it again. Uh, just go ahead and drag this out of my way. Or not. Let's go to the desktop and open up Saturn video. All right, again, capture by color camera, hit OK, and stack as many of these files as possible. So again, 94, 95% should be fine, hit stack, and allow that to finish. All right, so as you can see, Saturn is the first one that finished stacking, and it took about six minutes and 30 seconds. Jupiter's still running, but let's take a look at what we got here for the Saturn image from C-Star. Obviously, we can zoom in here. It's not like super impressive of course you can't really expect a whole whole lot of course you can see some of the moons here if you take a look um you have to keep in mind this telescope does not exactly have the focal length for planetary photography but the fact that we're able to actually see it um honestly i find pretty cool uh hopefully you can agree with me when i say that uh the saturn image actually came out pretty decent given the fact that again it's an extremely low focal length but we were still able to get a nice view of the planet Saturn. Um, honestly, you can guys just go ahead and let me know what you guys think in the comments. Uh, I'm pretty happy with how it is, you know, honestly, for the fact that it was, again, taken with an extremely low focal length telescope. Uh, I do think it looks pretty neat, especially since, you know, it, it looks pretty tiny in the center of the screen. So here, but honestly, I'm more looking forward to see what we can do uh, with the planet Jupiter. Of course, these different planets would change, you know, circumstances are going to change as they get closer and as they get further away uh, from the Earth. Maybe we can try these different planets when they are at opposition. Uh, it's more than likely when we're going to see the best amount of detail on these planets, especially with a C-star S50. Um, but there's, there's these different controls here uh, as well. There's You can sharpen up your image even more, perhaps if you want to. Obviously, that doesn't look good for the Saturn planet. Uh, you can turn the brightness up and down. Honestly, the controls on here are extremely easy to use and uh, very beginner friendly as well. So make sure that you check out this program. Again, I'm extremely excited to see what we can get with Jupiter. So let's allow that to finish up real quick. All right, stacking is complete. As you saw, it took uh, 12 minutes and 59 seconds. And I'm really hoping we can get a good image of Jupiter. As you saw, um, it took, let me see how many frames it took 5267 frames at 10.17 gigabytes another reason i again will repeat if you're going to do planetary imaging with your c-star make sure you have plenty of storage space so that you don't run out that would be an absolute disaster but okay let's check out our image here zoom in and you can very very clearly see the bands of jupiter and honestly one two three four I mean, wait, is it? And five different moons. Honestly, that's very impressive for the Sea Stars 50. Uh, I'm very impressed, honestly. We can turn out the sharpness level up uh, just a bit here to try to get a little bit more detail. Um, maybe that is the red spot that we're able to get there. It's honestly quite difficult to tell. Uh, you can turn up saturation some as well. Right, obviously you don't want to oversaturate it. It's looking a little bit green, um, unfortunately. Perhaps the Bayer pattern was not uh, done correctly. So uh, turn down the saturation a little bit more and we can tint that uh, later on, just the normal pictures. Um, oh, actually we have this here. So is the RGB, um, of course, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I'm afraid I can't really do anything with that. I would have to do that on um, kind of processing in programs like Cyril. Uh, which I'm not really familiar with in regards to planetary. I'm more familiar with that with galaxies and nebula and stuff like that. Uh, but we can bring up the noise reduction just a bit uh, to get rid of the pixels that we have there. Uh, turn down the saturation a little bit. Bring up this contrast, just a tad, uh, to get rid of that ring that we have around here. And then zoom back out. And then to save your image, just go ahead and uh, let, me, let me zoom all the way out. There we go. Hit the save button and you will be able to find that in the working directory here. So go ahead and close out of that, hit yes. You can close out of all of this as well. It's going to be in the ASI video stack folder. So if you ever need to find it, that's where it is. Honestly, I'm pretty blown away with what C-Star was able to do uh, with Jupiter. Personally, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, definitely wasn't expecting really to see any kind of anything with Saturn, but here we are able to see the rings. Of course, it's not like we're gonna be using some sort of six inch Dubsonian telescope, no. 
it, it's completely different. It's very short focal length, but we're still able to see these and we're even able to see some detail on the planet of Jupiter, including the different moons. So honestly, I'm blown away. I think that's pretty cool. Now, the next thing that we can check out as well is the lunar processing. Again, that's going to be with ASI Studio. So go ahead and open up ASI Video Stack and we will drag and drop the lunar video into here. Uh, yes, it was captured by a color camera. Obviously, I'm not 100% sure what the Bayer pattern is here, uh, but we're just going to leave it uh, just like that. Hit OK. And there we go. We have the moon right there. The coloration seems normal. So what we do here is we switch it to moon and sun surface, and we bump up the stack percentage. Obviously, we want to select the main area where it's going to be uh, stacked. You can go ahead and drag and drop this box, leave it there. And once you're satisfied, you can go ahead and hit the stack button. As you can see, it was recorded in 1080 by 1920 uh, resolution, and we got 6,390 6, frames. And somehow this one was still 12.34 gigabytes. So again, if you're going to do lunar, planetary, solar imaging, make sure you have plenty of storage space left on your PC and on your C-Star. So let's allow this to stack. Okay, after 9 minutes and 39 seconds, it is now done. The lunar image is now complete. As you can see, everything is looking very sharp and very neat. Obviously, again, this is one of the very many reasons it's important that you stack your lunar images so you can get the most clarity possible. Now, several things you can do, obviously, bring up saturation. Uh, again, we have that kind of green tint. Those people who are familiar with programs like Adobe Photoshop, um, yeah, Pix Insight would be able to bring out different coloration. It's kind of like what we what they have in what's known as the mineral moon. Uh, it's another thing that can be brought out. But you can kind of play around with the sharpness level here. Obviously, you don't want to over sharpen it because it would make it look somewhat bad. Uh, so you can bring up the noise reductions a bit, lower down the sharpness level, just like that, and bring up the brightness too if you want. Um, but honestly, I'm pretty happy with how this moon image itself looks. So I'm just going to save that. But that was just a quick run through on how to actually use the program. Obviously, you can play around with it a little bit more, do some more editing later on. And now it's time to check out uh, what we can do with actual astrophotography. Uh, so here we have, obviously, as you saw, we, the first thing that we were taking an image of was M45. So when you use Serial with your C Star S50 images, Obviously, you want to check your preferences, uh, make sure that you have in the preferences the Bayer pattern uh, to set. Just give me one minute to load. It's going to take just, okay, yeah. Uh, Bayer information for files header are available. Make sure you have that checked. If you're not sure what the Bayer mosaic pattern actually is, it is not GBRG. Uh, that was for the Dwarf 2 that I still have it set as, but it will automatically convert just like that. Uh, for this, obviously, uh, because it has the dark files already built in, you're going to want to make sure that you use the script OSC preprocessing without darks, bias, or flats. Um, and you want to set your home directory, obviously, as the uh, file, the folder that has the lights uh, that you want to use. So hit open on that. And we're going to use the OSC preprocessing without darks, bias, or flats. And we're basically just going to run through the same system um, in all three of these different objects. So the first one, the Pleiades cluster. All right, so stacking for M45 is now complete. It only took two minutes and nine seconds, and that is while running the stacking for the other two uh, deep sky objects as well. Uh, but let's get started with the processing. Again, it's gonna be the same run through through every single one. Uh, so for the first one, M45, we click on our result.fit file. And as you can see, it's pretty small. The uh, C-Star S50 doesn't have a wild, wide field of view. Um, so that's kind of the results of it. We only have the portrait. Uh, hopefully, when we get that mosaic mode, we'll be able to get more of that wider landscape uh, style. Uh, so we put it in auto stretch, unlink our image, and here is our Pleiades cluster. Honestly, it looks incredible. And I'm always blown away by the images that C Star S50 is able to take. Uh, but let's get started with it to make it look even better. So first things first is our uh, background extraction. So we go here. We hit generate. Sometimes it is able to do it all correctly. Sometimes you have to lower the grid tolerance a bit down uh, so that it doesn't click on any of the uh, actual nebulosity of M45. Uh, once it's done, you go ahead and hit compute background. Once it's computed the background, you go ahead and hit apply. And it will just take one moment to apply. All right, now that that is done, uh, we can go ahead and do our 
uh, remove green noise. Just go ahead and do that. Apply. Again, once it's done, go ahead and hit close on there. Go to image processing, do your photometric color calibration. Uh, obviously, the great thing about C-Stars 50 is that it auto automatically has the coordinates saved uh, in here in the image, including the focal length, pixel size, and will also let you know if there's any kind of filters uh, built into that. Uh, so you, all you have to do here is just hit OK, generally it'll work perfectly fine. All right, as you see, it worked perfect. You know, we had no issues with that, and that's generally how we'll be all the time. Uh, so now we go ahead and put it into linear mode, and we start doing a uh, Starnet star removal. So go to star processing, Starnet star removal. Allow that to load, sometimes it does take a moment. All right, so now that we have Starnet here, we click on pre-stretch linear image, and we leave everything else the same. Don't recompose the stars. We hit execute here, uh, and it's just going to take the stars out so we can really work out with the background here. So allow Starnet to run, and we'll come back to once that's complete. All right, as you can see, Starnet is now done running, and here's our pre-stretched image. Now, there's a lot of work that we can do with it, and this is honestly extremely basic um, run-through that we're going to do with Serial. So first things first, we do our image processing generalized hyperbolic stretch. Uh, let's go ahead and bump this up to 100, hit enter, and click on a estimated symmetry point and start dragging it up. There we go. Now, another thing that you can do is you can go ahead and select this part here, reset that, and use the eyedrop marker uh, to set the symmetry point and start dragging it up once more. There we go. We get a lot more of that wispy nebula here uh, like that. We hit apply. Now we hit close. That, that should be okay for now. We go to our histogram transformation. We don't want to cut out any of the uh, nebulosity data. So we go ahead and drag this up just to where uh, our line begins. Uh, we can kind of drag that up a little bit more to bring that light back in uh, and bring this up to the tad bit more uh, to bring more of that darkness in. So hit apply here. Uh, we can do that one more time. Uh, except this time we just go to our linear stretch and bump that up. Obviously not too much. Again, we don't want to cut into the data that we have here. Uh, so to go ahead and bring this up a wee bit. Hit apply, hit close, and then we go ahead and do our color saturation. We just drag this up a bit. Obviously you don't want your image to be oversaturated. Uh, so you kind of just play around, play, play around with it until you're satisfied. Uh, so I'm going to hit apply here. I think that looks pretty good. You can do a color calibration to kind of neutralize the background. Uh, use current selection, background neutralization. Uh, that gets rid of a little bit of the colorization that we have here in the background. Uh, then we hit save, just like that. And let's bring the stars back in. Go to star processing, star recomposition. And we open up those files here. Star result and star mask result. Hit here, open. And now let's drag these stars back into our image. All right, there we go. I think that's looking pretty good. So we hit apply here, uh, hit close, and then we can go ahead and save this as a unique file. So there's our Pleiades cluster. That was just an extremely quick run through just to give everyone a basic idea. You know, we didn't do any deconvolution, any kind of pixel math. Uh, that's, that's later steps if you're trying to do more advanced work. Uh, but we're gonna close out of that now. And let's start working on the Flaming Star Nebula. So again, it's gonna be the same basic run through. So I'm gonna kind of try to speed through it a little bit. So first things first, I open, result.fit, open. We put this in auto stretch, unlink it, image processing, do our background extraction, generate that. Obviously that's too much. Generate, lower it down even more, generate. That should be good, compute background. Okay, hit apply here. Uh, then we go to our uh, remove green noise, apply, close. We do our photometric color calibration, just like this, okay. Okay, obviously it couldn't really do that uh, very well because we didn't do the stretch yet. Honestly, that does happen sometimes. Uh, so what we're gonna do is just put it into linear and we're gonna get rid of these stars first before we do any kind of uh, color calibration. So we do star processing, star net star removal, uh, pre-stretch linear image and execute. As you can see, Starnet was pretty quick to run, and here is our Flaming Star Nebula. So it's time to really do some work on this. We do our generalized hyperbolic stretch, kind of select where the nebula was, 
put the eyedropper and drag this up. Obviously that was not uh, accurate enough, so we can go ahead and select a different area. Reset that, select the eyedropper, drag it up again. That should be good. Hit apply here, hit close, and let's bring up the histogram a lot, as you can see. There we go, hit apply, and we can drag it up even more. Apply, and we can drag it up even more without cutting into the data. Apply, drag this down a tiny bit to really bring out that nebulosity even more. Apply, and then drag it up one more time to bring that black point back. There we go, apply there, hit close. And now let's go ahead and do our color calibration. Just select that, uh, make sure we neutralize the background here. There we go. And then we go ahead and do our color saturation. Drag up that amount there. Obviously we don't wanna do it too much because we don't wanna discolorate things. Hit apply here. Uh, let's do another generalized hyperbolic stretch, kind of select this area. I do want to bring in a little bit more saturation. So what we can do here, uh, we do our, let's see, saturation stretch. You know, set the synergy point there and kind of drag it up a bit. Obviously not too much, but that's, that's looking pretty good in my opinion. So we hit close here. Uh, again, once again, it's an extremely quick run through. Uh, we do our start processing, start recomposition. Start this result. And a star mask result. Let's bring the stars back in here. Obviously, we don't want it too much, uh, but just enough. So honestly, I think that's looking pretty cool. So we save that just like that. Save as a unique file. And then we close out of that one. And let's start working on a galaxy image now. So go ahead and hit open here. And you see 2903. We got about an hour of exposure time on this one. So I'm excited to see what we can do with that. Honestly, the... The galaxy looking beautiful right there. Uh, so first things first, we do our background extraction, generate that. Uh, let's make sure we get all these different highlights as well because none of these are uh, correct. There, once that's done, hit compute background and everything is evened out nicely. Hit apply here and everything is nice and one color. So that's good. We hit save here. Let's get rid of that green noise. Hit apply here. Got rid of that greenness there. All right, let's do our photometric color coloration. Hopefully it will work for us this time. We hit OK. OK, again, it did not work, and that's fine. So we get metadata from image. Uh, here, let's type this in. Maybe maybe the coordinates are not quite correct. NGC 2903. Try that again. Hit find. All right, let's try that here. NGC 2905 is what it ended up coming up with. But no, that did not work either. So. We're just gonna have to do it manually again. So first things first, we switch to linear, uh, save our image. We go to our star processing, Starnet star removal, and get to work on that. All right, Starnet is complete. It did not do a very good job uh, in regards to the linear stretch, but we're gonna try to do that ourselves. Obviously, generalized hyperbolic stretch, bump this up to 100, select our symmetry point, start bringing it up. Obviously, I would like to get more of that wispiness here. So I'm just going to select that one portion there. Uh, let's see. Reset that. Reset the eyedropper. Go back to the original image and start bringing this up. Obviously, we want to bring it up as much as possible uh, without kind of blowing out the core here. So just bring this up. Make sure we have a little bit of shadow protection here. Not too much, obviously. Uh, hit apply. And let's go to our histogram transformation. Bump this back down to one and start bringing this black point up. Of course, this is a galaxy. You do have to be very delicate uh, with this type of thing, honestly. Hit apply here. Bring up that black point more. Apply again. Bring it up more. Apply again. Bring it up a bit more and apply. Now, honestly, just the way that we did it, you can still see the wispy bands here uh, that are generally 
uh, honestly left out if you only cut the black point without doing the rest of the histogram transformation. Uh, but I'm liking how it's looking. So let's save that. Let's go to our color saturation, bring that up a bit. Obviously, we don't want to oversaturate it as always. Hit apply. Go to image processing again, color saturation, drag that up. Not too much because then it's going to look unnatural. There we go. That's looking pretty good in my opinion. So again, we save that and let's bring the stars back in. Alrighty, there we go. So let's bring the stars up to try to make it blend more into the image, make it look a bit more natural and pretty. We can actually bring up the stretch factor a tiny bit more as well, uh, if need be. But obviously you don't want to do it too much. Honestly, I'm, I'm liking how it's looking. I think this looks pretty good. So I hit apply here. I'm sat satisfied with how my image looks and I'm going to save this as a unique file. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at the images that we got just now um, in the whole processing session. All right, so here are some of the images that we got tonight. Obviously, let's start with the planet Jupiter. Now, again, I'm extremely happy with how this came out. I was honestly mind blown that the sea star was able to get the banding here and even the great red spot, even though it doesn't look that great in this picture. No pun intended. Anyways, uh, I'm still pretty impressed with what CSR 50 was able to do. Hopefully you guys were able to get the same type of results as well. Uh, my lunar image, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty blown away with what I was able to do as well. Again, the optics are very sharp. Everything always comes out looking very clean with CSR, so it blows me away every time. Saturn, it's cool that we were able to see the rings. Obviously, it's not. you can't expect uh, to get the same results as you would get with like a six inch Dobsonian or a very good telescope. It's a very short focal length, so you couldn't really expect that much. But honestly, the fact that we're able to see the rings and everything, it's pretty cool. Flaming Star Nebula, this was just about an hour of exposure time and I think it looks absolutely awesome. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Sea Star is always able to do an incredible job with deep sky objects. Now, I, I will mention I do have an affiliate link in the bottom uh, in the description. Um, if you guys do purchase the Sea Stars 50 using that link, I will get a certain amount of the commission. Um, of course, it does not raise the price of anything for the Sea Stars 50 for you guys to buy it. It just helps out the channel a lot. Uh, so if you are going to buy a Sea Stars 50, if you could do it through that link, that would, it means a lot. Um, let me know what you guys think in regards to the results. Hopefully the tips and tricks that were uh, mentioned throughout the video was able to help you with your uh, uses of the C-Star S50 as well. Um, personally, C-Star S50 is a great tool. A lot of people say it's a toy. I don't agree. I think it's a, an awesome tool for astrophotography uh, for those who are both getting into it and those who are already experienced in astrophotography. Um, so let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Uh, please leave a like and subscribe. Honestly, it does mean a lot uh, to see the support from everyone for the channel. It makes me want to do more. Um, if you have any ideas for future content as well, please make sure you leave that in the comments below. Thank you everyone for watching. This is Scott Siestra Photography. Have a good night.